fullness, God. Father, we thank you right now, God, for your power to overcome, God, your power to resist, God. We thank you right now, God, and we thank you for your word. And it's in Jesus' name that we pray. Those of you in agreement with me, say amen. Amen, amen, amen. Well, before you're seated, find two or three people, hug their neck, greet them again. Just make them feel welcome in here tonight. strengthening the word and uh it took a little turn as pastor's been sharing on uh the strength to resist the strength to resist and i want to stay right along in that thought we're going to be talking tonight for a title it's going to be the strength to resist through abiding in christ so uh as you i've been in these services on sundays and on wednesdays so uh this is really just um it's just, I guess, inviting you into some of my private time and fellowshipping with God, just uh, as, you know, you review your notes and God reveals things and, and you see different things in the scripture as, uh, as you're looking back over the things that were shared on Sundays and Wednesdays. And uh, I believe some of these things are going to be impactful and powerful to you as they have been to me. So uh, let's jump right into this. We're going to start here in James chapter 1. And uh, we're going to review a little bit before we dive into things. James chapter 1. And, uh, and as you're turning there, I'm going to give you three words. I'm believing that we'll have an opportunity to hit each one of them. Uh, but these, these are the three words that kind of, uh, in my review of things that's been shared, that's just really stuck out to me. One word is identity. Identity. The second word is inconvenience. And the third word is pride. So identity, inconvenience, and pride. And uh, as we go through the scriptures and go through this here tonight, uh, I hope that we'll get a chance to, to look at each one of these things. So James chapter 1, starting here in verse 12. And as we're looking at this media, if you can get this in the, uh, in the message translation. We're going to go 12 through 15 in the message. Uh, James 1 verse 12, it says, Blessed is the man that endureth temptation, for when he is tried, he shall receive the crown of life. So I, I like the way this starts because it talks about that when you endure temptation or when you overcome temptation, God is saying that he has a reward for us. That, you know, temptation uh, doesn't just come and God looks at it and you know, that's the lot of a believer is that you're just supposed to suffer and go through trials and tribulations. And, uh, and God doesn't look down for, at that faithful servant and say, hey, you know, this is, this is my child who's serving me, and I want to reward them for their endurance. Let's keep looking at this. And that's, that's going to be key as, as we look through this uh, here tonight. It says, which the Lord has promised to them that love him. So it says, blessed is the man that endureth temptation, for when he is tried, he shall receive the crown of life, which the Lord has promised to them that love him. Let no man say when he is tempted, I am tempted of God. All, all these things are key because it begins, to, uh, it begins to set the picture of God's character, and it begins to set the pictures of, of the players that are in place. You know, and many times in, 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 uh, in the church community, it's confused who's the tempter, who's the trials com are coming by, uh, who's there to strengthen us and encourage us, even though it seems like those things should be obvious. Uh, many times as you talk to other believers who may not uh, have been taught as you have been taught, they don't see it the same way. But it's, it be it's beginning to lay it out. It says, let no man say when he is tempted, I am tempted of God. It says, for God cannot be tempted with evil, 
neither tempted he any man. But every man is tempted when he is drawn away of his own lust. When he's drawn away of his own lust and enticed, then when lust has conceived, it brings forth sin, and sin, when it's finished, bringing forth death. So let's look at this in the message translation. It says, anyone who meets a testing challenge head on and manages to stick it out is mighty fortunate. For such persons, loyally in love with God, the reward is life and more life. So for those who uh, face that temptation head on and overcomes it, it says, you can keep that up. It says that their reward is life and more life. It says, don't let anyone under pressure to give in to evil say, God is trying to trip me up. So it's not God that put cancer on us. It's not God that uh, has us in a situation where we don't have enough financially. It's not God that has uh, a harsh, a hard boss that's uh, over us and he's overbearing and he's, uh, he's unreasonable. It's not God that brings those things to try to trip us up. It says God is impervious to evil and puts evil in no one's way. God is not setting evil before you for you to trip up. Let's keep going. The temptation to give in to evil comes from us and only us. We have no one to blame but the leering, seducing flare-up of our own lust. Lust gets pregnant and has a baby. That baby's name is sin. Sin grows up to adulthood and becomes a real killer. It's, it's, it's so amazing because it's, it's again, it's, it's laying out who's the characters. You know, we know it says the thief comes to steal, to kill, and to destroy. And it says that when sin conceives, it, it brings forth death. It brings forth death where? Maybe not physically, can be physically, but maybe not physically, but uh, death in relationships. Death in uh, prosperity that God's trying to bring into your life. Death in opportunities. All these things that the enemy comes in to steal, to kill, and destroy. But notice it says that lust comes from what we're enticed with. You know, how many of you like chocolate? How many like chocolate cake? Chocolate cake. So, you know, if I was, well, maybe not me. Who's a good baker? I don't know. But um, my daughter, Christina, she's a good baker. So, you know, if she was to bake a nice, hot, moist, rich chocolate cake and you know it's fresh out of the oven and you can smell it you know and you had your new year's resolution though (laughs) you know that cake could be tempting to you but let me tell you something that cake is not tempting to me because i don't like chocolate cake for some reason german chocolate cake i like are the things that the enemy can pull on to cause us to trip up and uh one of the words for offense it's called, uh, it's called a bait, a trap. And uh, one of the words I like is, is called, or uh, a phrase is a stumbling block. A stumbling block. So when it comes to relationships and the enemy puts that bait out there to see if he can get us to stumble in that relationship, causes, uh, I won't say causes, but... Um, Somebody you may be in a relationship, whether it's a sibling, whether it's a uh, co-worker, whether it's a parent or a child, uh, that person says something to you in a certain way, and the bait is laid out there and is seeing, will you take the bait? Will you endure and overcome that temptation, or will you give in and have a bite of that chocolate? Kate, so moist, so rich, so sweet. (laughs) <laughs> you know, uh, I, I want to go over here. We're going to do a little bit more review. Uh, let's go to Matthew chapter 3. Uh, we looked at it last week in Luke chapter 4, and it's talking about, um, it's, it's talking about the temptation in the wilderness. And in fact, let's go to Matthew 4 first. We'll look at that temptation. It's talking about the temptation in the wilderness. And it's, it's very interesting, A, how the enemy tried to trip up Jesus, but then B, 
not just what Jesus said, but I think it was deeper than that. I think it was a core understanding that he had. And uh, is, is going to be the first thing that we're going to stop at and look. So Matthew chapter 4 says, verse 1, Then was Jesus led up of the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted of the devil. And when he had fasted 40 days and 40 nights, he was afterward a hungered. And when, he, uh, when the tempter came to him, he said, If thou be the Son of God, command that these stones be made bread. But he answered and said, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. Then the devil taketh him up into the holy city and setteth him on the pinnacle of the temple and saith unto him, If thou be the Son of God, cast yourself down, for it is written, He shall give his angels charge concerning thee, in their, hands, uh, in their hands they shall bear thee up, lest at any time thou dash thy foot against a stone. Jesus said unto him again, It is written, uh, Thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy God. Again, the devil taketh him up into an exceeding high mountain and showeth him all the kingdoms of the world and the glory of them, and saith unto him, All these things will I give you if you will fall down and worship me. Then says Jesus unto him, Get thee, uh, get thee hence, Satan, for it is written, Thou shalt worship the Lord thy God, and him only shall thy worship. Then the devil leaveth him, and, be and behold, uh, the angels came and ministered unto him. So we, we see what Jesus did in that he referred back to the written word of God. He referred back to the scripture, which is uh, it's, it's key because, A, he had the scripture in him, which means he spent time in the word, to know the word, to be able to have the proper response to the situation that was going on. But if you notice how the enemy was tempting him, the first two times he led off with, if you be the son of God, if you be the son of God, the same way he did with Adam, he said, did God say? He, start, he started off with a question to get Jesus to start questioning. Just like he did with Eve, he started off with a question to get her to start questioning. Well, did God really say that I can't eat of this tree? Hmm, that's a good question. So with Jesus, he starts off with a question to get him questioning. And what was he trying to get him question? Who he is. He's trying to get him to question his identity. He's trying to get him to question his identity. So he does that twice. Then he comes back the third time. He noticed that Jesus both times didn't take the bait. So he went over and he says, okay, he doesn't ask him again, if you be the son of God. Now he starts tempting him to try to enter into pride and rush into what God has already promised him. He starts to get him into, if you try to get him into, if you look at it, it says, uh, and the devil again, verse eight, taketh him into a seat in high mountain and shows him all the kingdoms of the world and the glory of them. God has already, God the Father has already promised him all that. But the enemy is trying to get him to take it in advance illegally. The same way he tries to do with many single folks to in advance illegally take someone who's not your spouse. So he, 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 he tries to get him to question his identity. Then he tries to get him to jump the gun and go in advance and to enter into pride and say, well, all this is mine. Let me just go ahead and take it. But there's a price that I have to pay to take it. I have to bow my knee to him. Now let's go back to chapter 3. What was the foundational understanding and why did Jesus have this foundation? Start in verse, uh, verse 13. It says, Then cometh Jesus from Galilee to Jordan unto John to be baptized of him. But John forbade him, saying, I have need to be baptized of you, and you come uh, to me. And Jesus answering said unto him, Suffer it to be so now, for thus it becometh us to fulfill all righteousness. Then he allowed him. And Jesus, when he was baptized, went up straightway out of the water, and lo, the heavens were opened unto him, and he saw the scripture, uh, he saw the spirit of, of God descending like a dove and lightning upon him, and lo, a voice from heaven saying, this is my beloved son 
in whom I am well pleased. So that foundational understanding came from God the Father himself speaking to him and letting him know and, and, and assuring him of who he is. And that's why it's so important that we have our personal time with God because that's the only way you can be confident of who you are in Christ is through your relationship with Christ and knowing that you are a child of God and knowing that the scriptures have convinced you of such is by you spending time in the word of God. You know, there's a scripture over in, um, over in Proverbs and it says, uh, it says the seller, excuse me, the buyer says, it is not, it is not. And it says, but after way, afterwards, he goes away and he boasts about the bargain that he got. That's the DKL version, um, which simply means, uh, I believe the Amplified says, uh, it is worthless. It is worthless. Uh, then he goes away again uh, bragging about the bargain that he got on, on, the, uh, on the thing that he told the seller that it wasn't worth anything. And I'm convinced this is what the enemy does to believers every day. He begins to attack their and understanding their value and saying that you're less than who God says you are. And when we believe that lie, we will accept the lot in life that the enemy is putting before us. You know, uh, one of the ways you can tell the worth of something is by the price that was paid for it. And when you consider the price that was paid for each one of us, then we begin to understand the value that we have to God. You know, uh, I believe it's Psalm 49, it says, uh, it says the redemption of, uh, of the soul is costly. And I believe in the Amplified, it says the redemption of a soul is costly and no man can pay it. So when you begin to talk about the price and the value of each one of us, then we begin to understand that we shouldn't be selling ourselves short to the enemy or selling ourselves for less to the, or at all really, but sell, selling ourselves uh, and valuing ourselves less than what God values us. And that's why it's, it's, uh, it's imperative that we're spending time having our identity in Christ established because it's only through that identity in Christ that you can stand and you can confidently know that you are able to overcome any attack of the enemy. Because when you begin to realize, hey, you know, I, I grew up and this isn't, uh, this isn't biblical or Christian in any way, but it's just how I grew up. <laughs> I, I grew up uh, and uh, my brother was just kind of a, a bad guy, a tough guy. So I kind of had, hey, I go anywhere, I do whatever. <laughs> You know, I had backup. You know, I'm good. I'm good. I, I, I went anywhere, did what I want to do, and, and I was pretty okay with it. And, that, and that's, that's, that's in a worldly sense. And as believers, we, we got to have even more confidence when we know who we're connected with. You know, we're talking about strength to overcome the enemy. It's, it's, it's embedded in our understanding of who we are in Christ. When you know who you are in Christ, you won't give in and quit so easily because you know that you have, that God has your back, that God is able to carry you through and over whatever it is that you're facing. Let's, let's, let's keep going. Uh, I want you to write this down. It's extremely important to recognize what are the celebrated values of your core group of people you're around the most. It's important, extremely important to recognize what are the celebrated values of your core group of people you are around the most. See, uh, pastor said, he said, associations are everything. And the truth of it is, as the scripture says, Iron sharpens iron. So if you're around other like-minded believers, they're going to strengthen you and encourage you in the word. 
But the scripture also says evil communication or contrary communication corrupts good morals. So the celebrated values of the people that you're around, they're either strengthening you or they're weakening you. What are the values of the people that you're around? You know, are, are those values that, hey, because of my race, it's hard for me to get a job? Are those values that, hey, you know, I've been single so long, or you've, you've been single long enough, you need to just go ahead and accept whatever? You know, and there's, there's balance to that. It's like, you know, some standards are too low, some standards are too high. It's like... <laughs> Okay, we're going to leave that alone. <laughs> but but what, are, what are the celebrated values? Because it's extremely difficult to overcome a value that you celebrate. Because the truth of the matter is, your preacher can tell you something, your pastor can tell you something, your mama can tell you something, your, your brother in the Lord, your sister in the Lord can tell you something, but the values that you celebrate is going to speak and ring louder than what anybody else says. So you have to begin to look at what are the values I celebrate. You know, if you find yourself always or continually in a certain situation, begin to ask yourself, okay, what, what are my values that are continuing to lead me to this, to this situation? Do, do I value fun more than I value character? In people? Do I value, you know, just having a good time? Is that, is that all that means anything? Or do I pause and look at, okay, I, I, it always starts out as a good time with this individual, but we always seem to end up over here, and the, the core issue is that person has character flaws, but yet we overlook that because our celebrated values in that situation is just having fun. Hey, girls just want to have fun. So I said I'm going to invite you into some of the study that I've been going through. And so some of these are brutally honest, and they're, I guess, brutally honest for me. But, um, you know, I was, I was looking at some things, and I, I start to ask myself and ask God, okay, so why is this like that? Why, why do I have challenges in this area? And, and one of the things God said to me was, if you be honest, you probably whine and complain about things in your lives. In, your, in my life that I desire, but I am not applying faith pressure and even less time dedicated to studying the word on that thing. So we can have little things that nags us. You know, they're, they're not major things in, in that you're, uh, I don't know, in that you're not in fornication or whatever, and I'm not trying to magnify or belittle anything but I'm, I'm just saying uh, you have little things, and we have little things that we tolerate, but then after a while you begin to realize, hey, this thing just continues to go on, and, and why is that? And, uh, you know, many times it's because we just whine and complain about things rather than really seek God, okay, what is the answer to overcome this thing? You know, having adult children me and my wife, you know, we have conversations when we have interactions with them, and some of them are less pleasant, and you're like, and you start talking, and, after, and if it happens again, and it happens again, and it happens again, you, you can find yourself commiserate, commiserating, commiserating, thank you, <laughs> uh, that was my five dollar word, um, <laughs> You, you, you find yourself comforting <laughs> one another over the slight from a child, but do you then go and say, okay, God, how can we get uh, beyond this? Or do we just wait for the, no the next situation and then we just commiserate again, wait for the next situation, and we just keep going around this cycle, but we never turn to God and say, hey, God, how do we overcome this situation? How, how, how do we get stronger? And, and, and watch this, not speak against our child's 
change because you'll find yourself beginning to speak to one another about, oh, yeah, that's just so-and-so. You know, that, that's just the way he is. That's just the way she is. That, you know, that's just the way they do things. And it could be your own loved one. And you're cursing their, you know, their ability to change. And now we're partnering with the enemy rather than, you know, we'll take time in prayer and we'll speak the word over them, but we'll take time and live in life and speak contrary to what we just prayed. Let's, let's go here to Proverbs chapter 18 and media, if you can get uh, the several different translations we want to look at here. You know, uh, the truth of the matter is many times when you're done wrong by an individual, yes, you have suffered a wrong, but the question becomes, what lens do you look out of? You know, do, do you look out the natural lens and, uh, you know, the, the, the enemy tries to get us to this, um, to this, just this mindset of being a helpless victim. And as a believer, you're anything but that. But he tries to get us to uh, feel sorry for ourselves and, you know, get other people to say, oh, that was so wrong. And, and all that stuff could be true. Yes, it was wrong, but you got to choose. Do you want to feel good because somebody else patted you on the back and said they were wrong and they should have never did you like that? Or do you want to find the wisdom and the power of God to overcome? Proverbs chapter 18, we're going to look at verse 14, and we're going to look at this in several different translations. And this, this is dealing with, uh, this is dealing with uh, healing, but uh, there, there's, there's a key thing in here that I think will come out. It says, verse 14, the spirit of a man will sustain his infirmity, but a wounded spirit who can bear. So your spirit man your spirit man, your inner man, if that man is strong, it can help you overcome whatever it is that you're facing. But if your spirit man is weak, you're not going to have the power to overcome. The, let's look at this in the New Living Translation. It says, the spirit of, spirit of a man will sustain his infirmity, but a wounded spirit, uh, that's King James. Next one. It says, the human spirit can endure a sick body, but who can bear a crushed spirit? Pause right there. First thing we need to look at is you have power to overcome sickness. You have power to overcome sickness. Your human spirit, your spirit man can endure, overcome a sick body. But if your spirit man ain't built up and fed in the word of God, you won't be able, it says, a, a crushed spirit who can bear. Let's keep going. It's amplified, it says, the strong spirit of a man sustains him in bodily pain or trouble, but a weak and broken spirit who can raise up or bear. You know, I, I've, I've, I've seen people like that where you, you encourage them and you encourage them and you encourage them and you encourage them and you encourage them, but at some point, it's got to stick. At some point, they got to make a decision that I'm going to stand on this word that's been given to me. Their spirit man has to wake up or you're just pouring into a, a, a bottle with a leak in it and it's going to continue to leak out. At some point, we got to be able to hold on to the word that we're receiving. I think we got one more message. It says, a healthy spirit conquers adversity, but what can you do when the spirit is crushed? Our spirit, man, is, is it's, I mean, it, it's, it's vital that we're building it up. And building it up is, starts with hearing the word, but it's, uh, as the scripture says, hearken, hear and do. You know, it says, uh, those who by reason of use have exercised their senses. Those are the ones that are mature believers. Uh, I, I heard, uh, I was listening to, uh, uh, Brother Copeland's share, this is years ago, I got a 
faith series that I go back to and listen to every, every now and then. This thing is probably 20 years old. But, uh, but he shares a story on, uh, on there was a healing line, and people were coming down to receive healing. And he said, uh, he said God just gave him a vision as he was just, he was, he was actually sitting in the audience and just watching people come down. And he said, God gave him a vision of these people coming with these big old heads, but these scrawny little bodies. He's, and, and God began to reveal to him that intellectually, they were very advanced, but spiritually, their, their spirit man was weak. And, and, and he said God began to give him a vision that he's going to have to teach them to build up their spirit so that they'll have the ability to overcome. And that's the picture that we get in this scripture, is that we have to build up our spirit man. Let's go here to Proverbs chapter 20. Excuse me, 24, Proverbs 24. In media, you can get these in the translations. Also, we got a few translations. Verse 10, it says, if you faint in the day of adversity, your strength is small. And, and that's, that's, that, that's, that's such a revealing verse. Because, you know, we could come into service, we could praise, we can shout, we could run, we can pray with the best of them, what, you know, whatever it may be. We could preach. But in the day of adversity, if we give in and quit, that's where we show our true endurance, or uh, better said, the lack of endurance. Let's look at this in the message. If you fall to pieces in a crisis, there wasn't much to you in the first place. Boy, the, right, the message is brutal. <laughs> Can we get another translation? <laughs> a seeker-friendly translation. <laughs> if you fail under pressure, your strength is too small. See how friendly that was? I told you the same thing, but it wasn't as brutal. <laughs> but sometimes you need it in your face like that. It says, if you fail under pressure, your strength is too small. That's, that's so powerful. It's, you know, many times, you know, we think we're at a certain place. But, you know, when, you, when you're lifting weights, it, it's, you, it becomes obvious what you can lift. <laughs> Either you can get it off you or you can't. And, and that's what that scripture is saying. You know, I think I can bench X, Y, Z. I'm going to try to stay focused. Okay, all these little rabbits jumping around. Um, you know, I think I can do this in the gym. I think I can do that. You know, Pastor gave the example. He thought he can do 100 push-ups, but the reality is where you're at is what you're able to overcome. Let's keep going. It says, if you, if you are slack in the day of distress, your strength is limited. See, I, I like this, and it's... Uh, Okay, that's the New American Standard. Let's, let's look at this next one. This, this, is the one. this is the one that hit me. It says, if you remain indifferent in time of adversity, your strength will depart from you. See, that one there, it, it really hit me because, uh, again, God was just showing me different things where uh, times where situations would come up and I would be indifferent, where I didn't rise up and respond in the way that I needed to respond to the situation. You know, many times we, we look at relationships and we look at situations and we always crucify the emotional outspoken one, you know, the one that goes off, the one that blows up, but the quiet, indifferent one can also be fainting, can also be coming up short. And, and this was the thing that God was beginning to show me, that there's, there's times where I need you to respond, but you, you just sit there and let it happen. And that indifference can bring us to a place of callousness, can bring us to a place of coldness, can bring us to a place of, 
of, of not engaging and allowing God to use us to bring order into the situation. And again, all these are God trying to help us to overcome and to uh, be more than conquerors. We can't do that if God is saying, hey, I've, I'm telling you who you are. I'm putting in you my spirit. I'm giving you what you need. And now we either, A, choose a fleshly weapon and respond out of our strength, or B, we draw back and do nothing and just let it exist. I'll put this down. Either way you look at it, we must be hid in Christ to overcome and have godly responses. Life birthed out of reactions to others will always fall, fall short of Christ's best. If our reactions are only limited to uh, how we measure up and look at what others are doing, then it's, it's going to continue to fall short. Because what we'll do is we will evaluate their actions, and then we will begin to say, hmm, based upon their actions, are they deserving of a Christ response? But when you look at what God has uh, commanded us to do, as I have loved you, love them. Not as they have loved you, love them, but as I have loved you, love them, is not measuring and looking at what they have done, but we look at what Christ has done, and we begin to uh, deal with and uh, love others based upon that. Let's look here at Matthew chapter 5. Matthew chapter 5. And starting, looking here at verse 43, it says, You have heard that it has been said, Thou shalt love... I still have pages turning. Let me give you a second. Okay, Matthew chapter 5, verse 43. It says, you have heard that it has been said, thou shalt love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say unto you, love your enemies, bless them that curse you, do good to them that hate you, and pray for them which despitefully use you and, and persecute you, that you may be the children of your father which is in heaven, for he maketh his son to rise on the evil and on the good, and send it his reign on the just and on the unjust. Notice this, again, <laughs> our identity in Christ and the identity of our Father is not to look at others based upon what they're doing to determine how we're going to deal with them. But we deal with people based upon the fact that we're just good and we give forth good. Verse 46, it says, For if you love them which love you, what reward have you? Do not even the publicans the same? See, sometimes we get uh, so, you know, we get so proud and, and, and think we accomplish something when we do good to people who have, in general, been good to us. But God says, what, you know, that's not too much special. He says, even sinners do that. He says, and if you salute your brother only, your brethren only, what do you more than others? Do not even the publicans so? Be ye therefore perfect, even as your Father which is in heaven is perfect. Let's go here to uh, chapter 7. Again, if our reactions and our responses to others are only birthed out of what they have done, then we're going to find ourselves coming up short and we're going to find ourselves giving in to temptations when that bait is presented. Matthew chapter 7, it says, verse 12, Therefore all things whatsoever you would that men should do to you, do you even so to them, for this is the law and the prophets. 
So it says, it, it starts off with seed. Because it's saying what you're expecting to receive, the harvest, it says sow that seed. If, if you're wanting good in your life, then, you, then we must be people who go about sowing do good seed. So, again, we can't be reactive and say, okay, they sowed good to me, so now let me bring a harvest of good onto them. We have to go about just spreading and sowing good seed. Spreading and sowing good seed. Spreading and sowing good seed. Okay, back on my couch. So, I asked myself, self, 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 huh? Uh, <laughs> so I asked, I said, okay, God, so why, 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 why do I respond in the flesh in this area? And it's most of the times because of harbored offense. It's because of harbored offense. We say we're over something, but the reality is we're, quickly reacting to things because it's a harbored offense. It's, 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 uh, it's something that's bruised, so if you just tap it, there's going to be an overreaction. It's not even reacting to the situation that's there before you. It's an overreaction based upon the hurt that, was, uh, uh, that, was, that occurred a while back. Another reason is a lack of appreciation of the impact of responding in the flesh. Many times we can have a lack of the appreciation of the impact of responding in the flesh. What do I mean? We don't appreciate that we can only duplicate what we demonstrate. So especially if you have young ones in the house, we don't appreciate that our actions can, is going to begin to be duplicated in those who are in our house. We also don't appreciate that we reap what we sow. Therefore, we're helping to create a toxic environment. So when I'm acting out in the flesh, I'm sowing. So I'm looking for good fruit from my spouse, good fruit from my children, good fruit from my sibling, good fruit from a coworker, but I'm sowing, and then now I'm putting the responsibility and the onus on them to be the bigger Christian. Let's keep going. It says, uh, why, do, why do I act out in flesh? Because getting too relaxed at home. We can get too relaxed at home as if the requirements of walking in the spirit does not apply for home. We could get too relaxed. You know, when you're out, you're, you're on your best behavior, you get home, you just, oh, okay, kick back, get my pajamas on, uh, get my slippers on, get my comfortable shirt, and we're just kicking back. And, you know, wife's like, uh, can you go do this? It's like, I, I am, uh, I'm focused. I'm a focused person. So if I got my iPad, my headphones, and Netflix, I don't want to be bothered. <laughs> it's like, I'm, you know, Netflix could hook you for 10 hours straight. It's like, I'm in a series. And my wife asks me something, something. Just... Just one headphone. Huh? Okay, okay. And it's, we just get too relaxed. At work, it's, yes, sir. Yes, ma'am. But you get home, it's like, shoot, I deserve a break today. <laughs> but why do we respond in the flesh? Why do I respond in the flesh? Because we get too relaxed. And the truth be told, that's when it matters most. That's when we must remain mindful of do good seed. 
Let's go here to Galatians chapter 5. Galatians chapter 5. In verse 14, it says, uh, For all the law is fulfilled in one word, even in this, thou shalt love your neighbor as yourself. But if you bite and devour one another, take heed that you be not consumed one of another. This I say then, walk in the spirit and you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. For the flesh lusts against the spirit and the spirit against the flesh. And these are contrary one to the other so that you cannot do the things that you would. But if you be led of the spirit, you are not under the law. And the, the only thing I want to bring out in this is the people that are supposed to be our source and our, uh, our harvest of good, we begin to tear into one another. So it's like... Uh, you know, the scripture says any two touch and agree on any one thing. If you're married, it's like you got, you got your second right there. But the enemy try to keep us at odds so that we're not accomplishing things in God, but we're quarreling over little things that matter about nothing. Uh... The, the next thing I want to bring up, I talked about the word inconvenience, inconvenience. And um, when, when, it, when, it comes, when it comes down to it, th there has to be a follow-through and a doing of the word. There has to be a follow-through and a doing of the word. Pastor Derek shared with the staff, I think last week, as we was coming into the anniversary week, and, he's, and he was telling the staff, and he was sowing this seed, and uh, he was like, hey, it's going to be a stress-free stre stress event. It's going to be a stress-free anniversary. And, you know, we're getting the word out, stress-free, stress-free, whoo, stress-free, stress-free. And uh, it occurred to me, stress-free does not mean inconvenience-free. Stress-free means that I'm not going to allow something to stress me. But as a servant, I must realize that when you take the title of servant, you, you also take with it the willingness and the readiness to be inconvenienced. That, that's just part of what comes with, the, uh, comes with it, that you're, you're going to be inconvenienced. So it's the day before, uh, and I was supposed to get something to a certain department, didn't get it to them to the day before. They were like, my gosh, it's supposed to be stress-free. And they, they, you know, they were right. I, I got it to them late. But the reality is it still has to happen. And we're all been inconvenienced and we're just going to have to accept the inconvenience. So it's how we deal with the matter is what begins to change whether or not we take offense or whether or not we say, you know what? No, stress-free means it's supposed to be perfect, and that's just not reality. See, it's reality in our minds that when I do something, I always do it right, but when I did it wrong, it was because of this happened and that happened so, okay, surely they understand. But then when it comes back and they're, they're also, you know, they turn that around and it's like, hey, they did something kind of slipped up and they need your help. They're wanting you to have that same grace that you just extended to them. So when it comes to overcoming, when it comes to having a prosperous life financially, stress-free doesn't mean inconvenience-free. Uh, prosperous life doesn't mean inconvenience-free. Prosperous relationship doesn't mean inconvenience-free. You're going to have to talk through some things, work through some things, uh, overcome some things. 
It's, it's going to take work. And it is, it's, it's vital that we understand that, you know, a lot of times we think, and the lie that the enemy gets us to, to buy into is uh, the good life is the, is the problem-free life. The good life is the challenge-free life. And, uh, this, I mean, the scripture tells you that that's a lie. Many are the affliction of the righteous. There, there, there's, there's challenges. And, you know, why are we overcomers if we have nothing to overcome? You know, why are we more than conquerors if there's nothing to conquer? You know, we're, we're, we're equipped to overcome. We're equipped to deal with the inconvenience and to deal with the challenges, but it's not the lack of challenges that determines whether or not we're going to have the good life. Okay, I'm trying to figure out how I'm going to get all this done. Uh, okay, so let's turn this corner here. So let me put this disclaimer out first. So when we talk about relationships, we talk about normal relationships. We're not talking about physical, sexual abuse, uh, infidelity in a marriage. We're talking about working through normal stuff. And those things can certainly be overcome through Christ, but, uh, but right now we're, we're dealing within the bounds of normal. So within a relationship, whether it's marriage, parent, child, sibling, friends, we must make a decision to honor the word concerning people. We must make a decision to honor the word concerning people. Meaning, if our boss is mean or harsh, we must still honor the word concerning them. If our parent or child is difficult, we must find a way to still honor the word concerning them. If our spouse is difficult, we must find a way to honor the word concerning them. And the fruit of that decision is biblical contentment. See, just like financially, when the word is preached and the word comes forth, the promise that's preached is prosperity, more than enough. But many times, uh, people may find themselves in either an instance or a season with, uh, uh, with, with trying to get by and, uh, and, and believe in God to, to make it. And in relationships, well, let me say this first, and in those situations, God will carry them through and God will help them and make a way so that they'll be able to, uh, that he will supply, as the scripture says, he will supply all of their needs according to his riches and glory in Christ Jesus. In relationships, uh, there's instances or there's seasons where it can be rough and it can be uh, challenging, but the bottom line, the farthest you fall is biblical, cont biblical contentment when we make a decision to honor the word concerning that person. Biblical contentment comes from the satisfaction of knowing that, God, I'm honoring you. Biblical contentment does not come from, I did this and it changed them, and now they're acting this way towards me, the way that I desire. Biblical contentment comes from, God, I'm walking in fellowship with you and honoring your word in doing what's right. See, and this is one of the things in the faith community that I think sometimes we lose sight of because we're shooting for the best as we should, but we need to realize that along that journey, sometimes in instances or in seasons, 
We have to be able to bear up underneath the word and honor that word concerning that person so that we can be honoring towards God. Amen. See, and it, it's, it's not a fun thing to have to walk through. And many times when people are in relationships, uh, particularly marriages, that can be in a season that's challenging, and they, I, I believe sometimes, I believe sometimes our goals and our sight is too earthly and too low. Our goals is just on accomplishing and seeing a change rather than allowing God to change us. And am I saying that you should not desire a, a marriage that's kissed uh, on earth and kissed by heaven and blessed? Of course not. That's not what I'm saying. But I'm saying based upon the season or the time that you may be in, you got to know how to overcome. Mm -hmm. You have to know that uh, every job you don't have to walk away from because the boss asks you to stay 15 minutes late. And that, that's just un, unreasonable. And uh, just the challenges that comes with being in a marriage of two people with two different uh, upbringings, two different uh, views on things and, and uh, how the kids should be raised, how money should be handled, and all these different things come together in one setting and try to figure things out. There's challenges that come with that, and you have to learn how to navigate through that. And it's not always calling it quits. And that's why I said within the bounds of normal, we have to have, we, we, we have to have a, a strength within us that we don't quit as believers. I, I believe we're, we're quitting way too easy. It's like, uh, it's not fun anymore. It, we're, I'm not, we're not happy. You know, it's like, okay, get your iPad, your headphones and Netflix, like I do. <laughs> <laughs> It's, you, you, seriously though, you, 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 have to, you have to find a way, and it really, you have to shift your target. Your target, see what happens is, our, we, we, become, uh, we become obsessed with seeing this relationship uh, evolve or, uh, or change into this beautiful thing, rather than fellowshipping with God, getting wisdom from God, uh, allowing God to show us how to handle the situation. Let's, let's look at this in uh, 1 Peter 3, because some of you are looking at me like I'm making this up. <laughs> like, you, you, whatever. I ain't got to do all that. Uh, okay, we got to make it happen quick. 1 Peter chapter 3. And media, if you can get this in an amplified, it says, verse 1, Likewise, you wives, be in subjection to your own husbands, that if any obey not the word, they also may without the word be won by the conversation of the wife, while they behold your chaste conversation coupled with fear. He's not talking about your, the words you're saying. Look at this in an amplified. It says, In like manner, you married women, be submissive to your own husbands, Subordinate, uh, subordinate yourselves as being secondary to and dependent on them and adapt yourself to them so that even if any do not obey the word of God, they may be won over not by discussion but by the godly lives of their wives. Now, I'm not bringing this out. We're going to stop there. I'm not bringing this out because of the, the role of the husband and the role of the wife. I'm just talking about Notice the instruction on how to deal with somebody who's not obeying the word. The instruction on how to deal with somebody when they're not obeying the word is to walk in a Christ-like manner. So that goes for husbands who have wives that are not obeying the word too. Walk in a Christ-like manner towards them. Walk in a, uh, goes for siblings. It goes towards uh, 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 a boss. Walk in a Christ-like manner. 
So there it gave the promise of, hey, it will change them. But again, I'm telling you, if you set your sight on, that's what I'm trying to get to. And that's, you know, and that's it. I'm not saying you don't release your faith. I'm not saying you don't confess it. I'm not saying you don't believe it. All those things are true. But what I'm saying is, uh, the scripture says, hope deferred makes the heart sick. So if all you're looking for is they better change. God, I'm doing this and they better change. You know what it turns into? It's, uh, I believe it's Luke chapter 18, where you have the uh, Pharisee and the publican, and they're there praying, and the Pharisee says, I'm glad I'm not like him. You know, I fast twice a week. I give tithes of everything, and, you know, I'm not like this little sinner. It, it, what happens is we become self-righteous. God, I'm doing this in your word concerning them, and God, they, they just need to change. Versus just fellowshipping with God. Fellowshipping with God. And, and allowing God to not only change them, but what will happen is you'll find yourself changing. And you'll find yourself less aggravated by some of the smaller things. Again, in the bounds of normal, most of the times it's just toothpaste with the cap off. You know, uh, a dish in a sink. Oh, I curse to some people when I said that. <laughs> they left a dish in a sink. <laughs> but it's, you know, it's sometimes, most of the times it's, it's things like that that, uh, that people have the hardest time overcoming. When really, in the grand scheme of things, really? Okay, I... I <laughs> Oh, okay, final scripture, then I'm out. I went a little over here. 2 Corinthians chapter 12. Strength to resist through abiding in Christ. Our spirit man will be strong when we're abiding in Christ. You know, pastor said, uh, a few weeks ago that many times uh, is really just through attrition that the enemy just simply outlasts us. You know, it's like uh, he hits us with a situation, uh, your boss was mean to you. Okay, overcame it day one. The boss was mean to you. O overcame it week two. The boss was mean to you. Overcame it week, uh, week four. The boss was mean to you. Okay, this is just enough. I don't have to put up with this. And just through his consistency, he just outlasted us when God didn't give you a release to leave that job. 2 Corinthians chapter 12, uh, verse 9, it says, And he said unto me, My grace is sufficient for thee, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. Most gladly, therefore, will I rather glory in my infirmities that the power of Christ may rest upon me. And what it, what it comes to is getting out of relying on our own strength. And whether we realize it, we do it more times than we, than, than we know. Because if we find ourselves giving out and responding in the flesh, what, what we're really revealing is I've really been trusting in my own strength and then my strength gave out. So therefore, all that was left of me was what came out, which was the flesh. But if I was standing in God's strength, then a godly response still would have came out. Amen? Amen, amen. amen. I thank you guys. Yeah. Thank you guys.